Paintings of grids are stranger than they seem. They first appeared in the beginning of the 20th century and are strikingly modern. The image and the materials that are used to make it merge into the same plane. As Rosalind Krauss says, the bottom line of the grid is a naked and determined materialism. But the strange thing is that even though the grid functions in such a material way that seems to oppose itself to symbols, metaphors and literature, the grid has been historically perceived and discussed in spiritual, religious and metaphysical terms. In this episode, we will take a look at how certain elements in the 17th, 18th and 19th century combined together to create the grid as a new aesthetic force in the 20th century. You're listening to the Unknowing Art Podcast, the show that makes you unknow the art you thought you knew. My passion is art theory and philosophy, and this is my way of sharing it with you. If you like the show, give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to support the show, I would be honoured. Link in the description below. The story begins in the 1800s. It was a century which saw some of the most radical changes to the ways that human societies organised themselves and to the ways that the human individual came to understand itself. In fact, it was the century that the human became an individual. If we consider the primary dilemma of artists today, as being the task of legitimizing their works amid a field of wild and varied objects. Imagine for a moment how much more tiresome the dilemma faced by the 19th century artists were. Their primary dilemma was for the first time to face the world without a stable of philosophers and priests and to use their own eyes to create an idea. For the first time, artists were not only responsible for the labour and technique of their work, but were now also responsible for the meaning behind it. The beginning of the 19th century was at polar opposites to the end of the 19th century. At its beginning, most societies were ruled by monarchs, but by the end of the century, New labour conditions brought about through the Industrial Revolution and the new technologies with which they could now produce caused a reorganisation of society. What this meant was that a new human consciousness would arise of what it means to be a self and what it means to exist. By the middle of the 19th century, the French poet Charles Baudelaire characterised this new world as the transient, the fleeting and the contingent. He had believed that doubt or the absence of faith was a vice peculiar to this age, for no one is obedient nowadays, he said. The 19th century was an age where the human was suddenly forced to become individual. Most old world kingdoms had collapsed by the middle of the 19th century and the new modern nations which had replaced them abolished slavery and serfdom. Now, the human was left to their own devices, had to fend for themselves and develop their own social aspirations in this new industrial world. The modern individual, through their social aspirations, broke down the visible distinctions of class, though class, the bourgeoisie, were still very much present. An example of this was the shift in attitude towards fashion. Previously, someone's social standing was immediately evident by the way they had dressed, but now the human would dress according to their social aspirations. Increasingly, the lower classes would invest in extravagant clothing, whereas the young bourgeoisie were infatuated by the carefree and awkwardly dressed English movement called dandyism. In 1842, Francois Girard, a French painter, wrote of the difficulties that artists then faced. 
The changes that have taken place in society over the past two centuries have made the condition of artists more difficult than it once was, he wrote. The choice of the subjects to be treated was then, so to speak, ready-made. Most of the time, it was only a question of renewing, in an elegant and ingenious manner, data whose type had been fixed by the religion of an invariable way. The individual thought of the painters was based on a traditional thought, and the absence of such a serious first difficulty made it possible to apply to the execution all the fullness of the faculties. Today, before seeing what a painter has done, we ask what he wanted to do. And, if from the outset his thought is not considered new and spicy, the fatal sentence is already rendered. As Gerard notes, there is no longer any external guarantee of meaning for the artist. The artist must supply their own meaning, and if it is not deemed genius enough, then the artist's work is not worthy of its existence. Forty years later, in 1882, this new attitude of the individual was dramatized by the German philosopher Nietzsche, who wrote, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? Artists had discovered a newfound freedom, but it was an empty freedom. The freedom of an empty sandbox to roam and play. It is no surprise then, that just before the middle of the 19th century, the forefather of existential philosophy, Søren Kierkegaard, wrote that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. It was a new modern anxiety of the individual which would become the study and occupation of the existential philosophers and psychologists for the following 100 years. It is the anxiety of the modern individual which is revealed in Krauss's understanding of the grid. In the discourse of aesthetics, the anxiety of freedom in the modern individual artist stems from the long-winded study of the notion of genius, which, in the 1700s, took a dramatic turn, leading to the redefinition of the role of the artist from a maker to a creator. The study of genius attempted to understand why certain people excelled in different fields. It had been studied in depth for hundreds of years and gives us a clear indication in the shift that occurs in the thought about art. The study of genius can be traced at least back to ancient Greece. For Plato and Socrates, in ancient Greece, the genius was someone who had been bestowed with genius by a deity. Today, we are accustomed to thinking about the creation of the universe. However, in Plato's text to Maius, he put forward a theory of making, where the demiurge of the universe was not a creator, but a maker. If the human is given the gift of genius by the gods, who are themselves makers, then the genius is also a maker. Though the genius might be blessed with supernatural powers, they cannot affect the laws of nature because they are working within a world that has already been brought into being. The genius, therefore, cannot create novel beings, but are simply able to see connections within the world that others are not able to, and therefore can invent things within the already existing system called the cosmos. What this means is that the genius invents things by imitating nature. This inevitably brings forth the problem of how new things come into being, which is often referred to as the problem of individuation. Plato's student Aristotle added further to the theory of making by suggesting that making always has an end outside of itself. Six hundred years later, a new theory of individuation which opposes Plato's is found in the Hebrew Christian tradition. In the year 346 AD, Athanasius, the Bishop of Alexandria, writes, For God creates, and to create is also ascribed to men. Yet does God create as men do? Perish the thought. We understand the term in one sense of God, and in the other of men. For God creates, in that he calls what is not into being, needing nothing thereunto, but men work some existing material. 
It is in this theological discourse that the word creation starts to emerge, yet it still maintains the same relationship between God and genius. Genius is a gift given by a God to the human and the human works with existing material. In contrast to Plato's theory of making, the notion of creation transcends natural laws. Just after Athanasius, Saint Augustine writes the following, The world was created by God, out of nothing, and this creation was due to God's absolute free will, not to any logical or other necessity, or to any idea outside of himself. Whereas the idea of making implies an end outside of itself, the idea of creation implies an end in itself. The Renaissance and Enlightenment scholars and artists would rediscover these ancient Greek texts. And from the 1600s onwards, the concept of the genius artist as an imitator would haunt artistic production. The Enlightenment was occupied with the founding of a universal reason, and it was therefore generally understood that the artist did not create things, but rather they made imitations of nature. In fact, the word create had no appearance in the discourse about art. There was much debate about whether the artist should imitate directly from nature or if an artist should imitate previously made artworks and thereby develop it, or if that was completely unnecessary and that the artist should resign the urge to make because the perfect imitations had already been done. It was on this debate that in the 1700s the word creation started to be used when talking about art. During this time, the idea of what genius was would change dramatically and would lead to the import of theological language into the aesthetic discussion. In the early part of the 1700s, the genius was now being thought of not as a gift by God, but in terms of something internal to the individual. Thinkers like Abdu Bas took seriously the question of the cause of genius. Dubos reacted against the neoclassical ideals of universal reason and tried to prove that emotion and imagination were the dominant aesthetic faculties, claiming that it is possible to create a work of art without any rules. Dubos took seriously the human imagination and emotion. In the 18th century, this new notion of genius as internal to the individual led to the disintegration of the 17th century theory of art and the 17th century standards of taste. Herbert Dijkman summarizes the changes in aesthetic attitude in the following text. The work of art is no longer judged by the degree of conformity with traditional patterns and rules, he wrote, but by the degree of delight it gives, and this delight is caused not by rational structure and intellectual simplicity, but by the free play of imagination and emotion. At the same time, a keen interest in the creative powers of the artist and in the psychological processes of creation awakens. The revaluation of inspiration and imagination, however, leads to a new appreciation of the phenomenon of genius. This new appraisal of the powers of feeling in the 18th century is furthermore connected with the delight taken in poetry as the immediate, unreflected expression of the poet's own individuality, of his personal thoughts and emotions. From the very beginning, the concept of individuality is closely linked with that of genius. In the year 1800, the English poet Coldridge wrote that poetry is a dim analogue to creation. Those who championed the artist as creator were inevitably demanding the freedom of the individual artist to create. This kind of thinking would slowly bubble until it reached its boiling point in the 1900s where we find ourselves now living in the bathhouse of its steaming residue where everyone is a creator online. <laughs>
in ancient Greece and in the classical and neoclassical eras, the genius was thought to be related to divinity, but could only produce material imitations. After the neoclassical era, the genius was understood as a material, psychophysiological phenomenon and could now produce novel entities. In other words, the artist used to be an imitator, i.e. a maker, but is now a creator. As our understanding of genius becomes adverse to theology, the language used to understand the freedom of the artist imports theological terms. As the human becomes more individual, a new appreciation for the genius is found, and this new understanding of genius redefines the artist's role in increasingly theological ways. In the 19th century, the lack of compelling ideology forced artists to search for significant content within their own subjective experience. As the art historian Lorenz Eitner writes, being no longer the servants of creeds and institutions, they were responsible for the meanings as well as for the forms of their art, he wrote. The fact that their liberation brought with it this new burden became apparent early in the 20th century. An overconcern with subject matter was one response to this situation, a prudent self-limitation to pictorial problems another. The second difficulty involved the problem of communication. As artists endeavoured to express private meanings rather than broadly shared ideas, they found it hard to maintain touch with their public. The lack of common pictorial language brought about a new interest in symbols and other devices for casting complex contents into visual form. One such commonly used symbol was a figure within a dark intimate room standing at an open window, gazing longingly out toward the horizon in the distant landscape. This was a common motif among many artists in the early 1800s and epitomizes the attitudes of those who wavered between the yearning for the classical ideals of a universal reason and an intimate personal understanding of the significance of emotion and imagination. It is where these two ideals collide that a trauma is created within the individual. The French poet and philosopher Diderot, for example, spent his whole intellectual life arguing against himself as if he were two different people. This trauma cuts all the more deeper because the theological language which was once used to understand the gift of genius is now inherited and used by the very opposite understanding of the genius, that the artist has become a creator. The matrix that this trauma sets up is clearly shown in the motif of the open window. And it is the bars of the window which function as the barrier between the interior setting and the external world. The window is like a threshold and at the same time a barrier, Heitner writes. Through it, nature, the world, the active life beckon, but the artist remains imprisoned, not unpleasantly, in domestic snugness. Rosalind Krauss adds, the window is experienced as simultaneously transparent and opaque. As a transparent vehicle, the window is that which admits light or spirit into the initial darkness of the room. If, but if glass transmits, it also reflects. And so the window is experienced by the symbolist as a mirror as well, something that freezes and locks the self into the space of its own reduplicating being flowing and freezing. Glace in French means glass, mirror and ice, transparency, opacity and water. The open window demonstrates the changes in attitude toward nature and the self, particular to a society, as Eitner suggests, that loved poetic suggestion but disliked the artificiality of outright allegory. It was, after all, the age which saw the emergence of the individual and the prominence of the poet as one who could express their immediate inner truth. For the French poet Mallarmé, the window functioned as the crystallization of reality into art. For Krauss, the window flows and freezes, first toward the flow of birth, the amniotic fluid, the source, but then towards the freezing into stasis or death, the immobility of the mirror.
The late 1800s saw the new study of optics research the effects and impressions of colours. Scientists studying optics would make grids of coloured squares to see how the composition of colours affected the eye. More generally, however, the study of optics was trying to understand the material conditions of perception. It fascinated artists at the time, particularly the Impressionists. Now, not only was the new modern individual taking seriously their emotion and imagination, but also their perception. The external world itself was becoming a kind of cinema. The eyes were windows which filtered light. Though optics could study true colours, no one human could actually perceive true colours. This deepened the initial trauma even further, but gave a new scientific direction for the study of inner life. When Krauss says, behind every 20th century grid, there lies like a trauma that must be repressed, a symbolist window, disguised as a treatise on optics. We can now understand that what she means is that the modern painter of grids, whose work appears as a material study of perception, has emerged as a result of the anxiety of coming to terms with the dizzying newfound freedom of the artist who, for the first time, is alone. They are no longer imitators of the universal reason of nature. They are now creators of form, of meaning, of perception. The existential uncertainties of the self brought about by the change in the understanding of the role of the artist as a creator rather than an imitator still remains in art practices in the 20th century. The grid, which is the shining emblem of modernity, which is so anti-symbolic and opposed to literature, is in fact riddled with theological language, and if it were not so, the grid would not exist today. By understanding the complex and rich history of the idea of genius and how it affected the debate of the role of the artist from a maker to a creator, we now have a far richer understanding of Krauss's myth of the grid. <laughs>